I will then pass it on to you, Ralph. Uh, Ralph is a professor of law at UCL, um, University College London. He is an expert in international law and self-determination and uh, the mandate system. And he uh, will be talking to us today about his, uh, I think, long, quite long standing now project about uh, uh, the illegality of uh, Israeli presence in the West Bank is, in Gaza. Is, is, that, is that the good title or? Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Ralph, for being with us. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure uh, uh, to be with you. I'm sorry that I haven't been able to, to join the other sessions and indeed that I can't be there in person. Um, it was just too long a trip to have to make. I'm sorry about that. Um, so today, um, I, I'd like to, this afternoon, I'd like to um, present some of the ideas that, are, um, as Itamar mentioned, I, I've conducted on the relationship, I've written um, about on the relationship between international law and the subject of Palestinian liberation. And this, this work includes an article in the Palestine Yearbook of International Law and also a related uh, policy brief that summarized um, some of the ideas I'm going to, to set out today concerning the uh, applicability of the international law of self-determination and the international law and the use of force to the question of the existential legality of the exercise of control by Israel over the West Bank and Gaza. I'm currently preparing um, a legal opinion which will address this issue as a general matter, the general issue of legality or illegality um, of the um, uh, what will be probably described, uh, characterized by the General Assembly as the occupation uh, over the West Bank, uh, including East Jerusalem and Gaza, in anticipation of the GA vote that may happen any day now, um, uh, requesting an advisory opinion of the ICJ on that subject. So that will be hopefully released at the same time the GA vote happens. So watch this space. I'll, I'll, I'll publicize it uh, on, on the usual places. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to set out my the thesis about the interplay between self-determination and the use of force. Uh, so obviously the starting point is the exercise of domination by Israel over Gaza and the West Bank. And um, setting aside uh, the, without prejudice to the particular legal test in occupation law, when it comes to the law on the use of force, uh, this, this clearly does meet the test for being a use of force, which is the international law euphemism for war, which includes uh, occupation and the exercise of control uh, further through military means. So it doesn't just involve, as it were, active hostilities, which is a sort of common misconception about uh, what it addresses. Um, and with Gaza in particular, um, the, the exercise of control uh, through military force obviously has continued. I don't need to tell uh, this group uh, how that has happened, so I won't bother with that. Um, uh, the facts are well known. The, the point to make legally is that this amounts to a sort of reconfigured uh, ongoing use of force exercised by Israel over the Gaza as a, a territory, uh, the territory of Gaza and its population. Quite apart from when it is then periodically supplemented by further means and methods of warfare, such as military incursions uh, and uh, taking other military action, uh, obviously in response to rocket attacks mowing the grass, general degradation efforts, targeted assassinations, etc. right? So those incidents are not the only moments when Israel is using force in international law terms with respect to Gaza. It is an ongoing situation, just as it is in the West Bank, uh, including uh, East Jerusalem. So it is 
this, this set for, for, for present legal purposes the same, even though obviously manifested in different ways. And of course, different ways in the West Bank, uh, in different parts of the West Bank. Um, obviously, um, again, this doesn't need to be um, argued uh, for in this group. Uh, the Palestinian people have uh, universally accepted to have the right of self-determination. And the, the significance of that is, of course, the right to be free from any external domination, including occupation or other forms of non-sovereign based territorial control, which of its nature prevents the full de facto exercise of this right. Uh, so the domination needs to end in order for the right to be exercised. This right operates and exists simply by virtue of the Palestinian people being entitled to it. So it's not something therefore that depends on anyone else agreeing to this. It is a, understood to be a right. Something which might depend on the agreement of another actor is by definition not a right. Now the anti-colonial form of external self-determination um, adopted around the middle of the 20th century uh, and applicable to the Palestinian people was of course a repudiation of the concept of trusteeship over people. According to that concept, people were ostensibly, potentially to be granted their freedom by colonial authorities if and when they were deemed ready by those authorities. The anti-colonial self-determination rule, which was the international legal basis for recognizing decolonization, scrapped this approach in favor of an automatic right. Mm -hmm. The new rule was and is rooted in a basic entitlement of people to freedom, not readiness. So in the words of the uh, UN General Assembly in Resolution 1514 of 1960, inadequacy of preparedness should never serve as a pretext for delaying independence. And this right operates regardless of whether the authority depriving the people of their ability to exercise self-rule agrees to relinquish control. So necessarily then, this form of freedom for the end of, of a certain form of external control is to be realized immediately and automatically without preconditions, such as standards having to be met first on whatever basis. So for example, an agreement with or approval by Israel, the UN, the quartet, other states, etc and in relation to whatever subject matter, so governance, readiness, security issues, undertakings uh, uh, to Israel, etc. Now, whether or not the meeting of these standards and agreement or support for arrangements to end the occupation by these actors are or are not important and desirable in a more general sense is not the point. The point is that the meeting of these standards and the agreement by these actors is not something that the realization of external self-determination is supposed to be lawfully made contingent on. Now, although the rights of Palestinian self-determination in international law and the necessary consequences of this, which is that the Palestinian people should be able to exercise the right free of Israeli control is near universally recognized, there is often a lack of acknowledgement of those logical next steps that I just set out concerning uh, the end of that control. So many commentators and states affirm the right of Palestinian self-determination only in the abstract, as if it does not then have some material significance to the ending of the control exercised by Israel over Gaza and the West Bank. So it's as though the sort of thought process has been started, but then not taken uh, to its logical conclusion. In some cases, this position is adopted on the basis of a view that the control over Gaza and the West Bank 
can and should be maintained for security purposes and or relatedly that its end should depend on a peace agreement that would include security guarantees for Israel, obviating the need to maintain the occupation for these purposes. So setting aside all of the other uh, potential reasons why Israel might uh, uh, continue with the occupation, notably of the West Bank, and for example, obviously in the context of potential territorial claims, we are, what I want to focus on now is the particular defensive security basis for maintaining the occupation of both places. So the question I want to ask is, does international law permit Israel to maintain its military control over Gaza and the West Bank, notwithstanding the, the, necessary, in, in the necessary impediment this causes to the realization of self-determination on this security defensive basis? Now, as I've said already, the, the control exercised by Israel over Gaza and the West Bank is, as a military action, is in the, in the terminology of international law, a use of force, which is the international law euphemism for war, which includes the kinds of uh, actions, uh, a, a, an exercise of authority in both places. Um, now, the, the only legal grounds for a state to, in, to control territory that doesn't form part of its sovereign territory and which is either the territory of another state or is a non-state self-determination unit. So you can pick your options there in the case of Palestine. Um, through the use of force is I, if firstly the host sovereign entity has validly given its permission and in my broader work, I deal with Oslo, and I won't address that here unless there are questions about it. I, my conclusion is Oslo does not somehow provide valid consent uh, to, to the, somehow the continuation of the occupation. Um, or the UN Security Council has given its authority for this under chapter seven of the UN Charter. That also has not been the case. And I, in my broader work, which will be set out in that legal opinion, I deal with resolution 242 in particular. And then thirdly, and this is what I will address uh, now, is it's a legally valid exercise of self-defense according to the international law on the use of force. And it seems to me that that really is the only conceivable basis on which the uh, exercise of military control through the use of force over Gaza and the West Bank could, could be lawfully um, justified. Now, so what is the legal test here? So, and forgive me if I'm, I'm really covering, you know, for, 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 for many, if not all of you, the, the, you know, the kind of basic international law 101 here. Um, the use of force in self-defense is only legally permitted according to the international law on the use of force, the Yossad Banan, if there is an actual or an imminent threat of an armed attack and that the use of force involved, which of course here is, it is uh, uh, we know the realities uh, of what that involves when it comes to the exercise of control, military control over Gaza and the West Bank, is a necessary and proportionate uh, response to that attack or the imminent threat of attack. Now, the question of whether this, uh, a, a, an actual or imminent threat of an armed attack meeting the legal test existed in 1967 and the introduction of the occupation as a consequence of the broader defensive response to it was necessary and proportionate is um, of course disputed, but in my work and in the legal opinion, I assume for the sake of argument that that test was met then. But of course, if it was not, then the occupation has been existentially illegal in use of force terms from the very beginning. So proceeding on the hypothetical basis that there was a lawful basis for introducing the occupation in 1967, 
Some commentators, including international lawyers, seem to suggest that provided this that existed then, the matter of legality has been resolved, not only for that moment, but also for the continued operation of the occupation. No further analysis is needed as time moves forward. In other words, the occupation can continue without this continuation itself needing to meet any justificatory test. So it's really left to the occupier, to Israel, to decide if and when they wish to end the occupation. Mm -hmm. By occupation, I mean the exercise of control, exercise, including the nature of the control exercised over Gaza uh, since the withdrawal of boots on the ground. Um, a more common view is that there is a legal requirement to end the occupation, presumably because of the right of self-determination of the Palestinian people, but that the test for when this should end, the end should come, or put differently, the test the occupation has to meet in order to continue to be justified, is something different from the general Yos ad Bellum test that I mentioned a moment ago. Specifically, some have suggested that the occupation can continue until there is a peace agreement. Now, bearing in mind that this kind of new test that seems to have been kind of conjured up out of nowhere in legal terms, given that it could enable the occupier to prolong the occupation by simply failing to engage in good faith efforts to pursue an agreement, a seemingly tighter version of this approach is that the occupation is permitted to continue until there is a peace agreement, provided that the occupier is making all possible good faith efforts to achieve that agreement. This is not the international law test. The requirement to meet the general ad bellum test that I mentioned before is an ongoing one in any continuing use of force, including a military occupation. Commentators and policymakers seem to overlook that the use of force requiring justification on this basis is not simply the initial period of invasion that precedes and enables an occupation. It is also then the operation of the occupation, including when it's reconfigured, as was the case with Gaza, and of course, post Oslo in the West Bank, since the conduct of an occupation, quite separately from the circumstances of its introduction, is itself a use of force. So in consequence, the test remains on an ongoing basis, needing to establish an actual or an imminent threat of an armed attack, and the type of force being used being necessary and proportionate to that. If the test is not met, then the military control exercised by Israel over Gaza and the West Bank is illegal, even in the absence of a peace agreement. Thus, whether or not a peace agreement has been reached, and whether or not the occupying state is taking all good faith efforts to reach such an agreement, are not by themselves dispositive of whether or not the occupation is or is not legally justified. This is not to say that Israel is not required in international law to make good faith efforts to reach a peace agreement. It's just that this is irrelevant to the question of whether Israel has a legal entitlement to maintain its military control over Gaza and the West Bank. Commentators and policymakers who wish to incentivize Israel, which seems to be what is partly going on here, to come to the negotiating table cannot invoke the right to maintain the occupation as a bargaining chip, since the right does not depend on a willingness or otherwise to negotiate, but an entirely different legal test. Now, beyond Israel's particular episodic responses uh, to rocket attacks from Gaza, the ongoing military control exercised by Israel over the West Bank and Gaza, if it's understood, as I say, which is really the only 
justification that bears any relationship to something that might be compatible with international law, if it's understood in defensive terms, is not, of course, about responding to an actual or an imminent attack, as, as I say, outside of responding to uh, the rocket attacks from Gaza. Rather, it is preventative self-defense, using force to stop a threat from emerging, either at all. So, of course, the control exercised in the West Bank linked in the case of Area A to security cooperation with the PA, or to a large extent, as in the control exercised by over Gaza. So another element to this is to understand the uh, occupation as a mechanism to prevent the existence of another fully autonomous Arab state at Israel's borders out of a generalized defensive concern in relation to this state. So here, potentially the point of the occupation is in effect to prevent a fully functioning Palestinian state for defensive security purposes. Obviously also in the case of the West Bank, the use of force is sometimes also explained in defensive terms as a means of protecting settlers and uh, settlements. And this again can be understood to be not only in response to actual or imminent attacks, but also more long-term preemption and prevention of emergent threats. Preemptive or preventative self-defense is not a valid basis for using force in self-defense in international law. Thus, the occupation in general and these actions taken in relation to settlers and, and settlements, in particular in the West Bank, cannot be legally justified on this basis. So the analysis that I've suggested is, has proceeded, of course, on the hypothetical basis that there was a Yossad Balan justification for introducing the occupation in 67. This conclusion on, on illegality is based on the absence of the necessary actual or, or imminent or, or threat of an imminent armed attack meeting the relevant test or the existence of such a threat, but the disproportional relationship between the occupation and the threat in the period since 67. This conclusion is arrived at from the manifest impossibility of such a situation being in existence on a continued basis for anything other than a short period, given the narrow nature of the test in terms of both the threat required and the requirement of proportionality that the occupation must meet in order to be justified, even if a threat meeting the test is in existence. So the effect of this analysis is that there is no lawful basis for Israel to maintain its military control over Gaza and the West Bank. Or to put this differently, there is no ability for it to lawfully impede the Palestinian right of self-determination through this action. As a general matter, and in the specific context in the West Bank of protecting Israeli settlers and settlements. In consequence then, the exercise <laughs> of military control over Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, is existentially illegal as a breach of the international law on the use of force and the law of self-determination. And Israel is required to end it immediately. This latter requirement of immediate termination is a necessary re requirement of that right of the Palestinian people to have their right realized in instantly and necessarily not subject to any qualifications, as I mentioned before. Now, the nature of the breach of international law here is such as to meet the definition of aggression in international law. The term aggression um, uh, is uh, usually a, uh, used as a synonym 
for a breach of the international law on the use of force. And occasionally, as a subset of such breaches that are of a particular grave nature. Insofar as that latter subset definition is concerned, the breach here meets and exceeds the threshold. It meets it with the existence of uh, an unlawful exercise or uh, use of force in Jos ad bellum terms, and then it exceeds it through factors I haven't mentioned already, but I cover in the uh, other work uh, concerning uh, aggravating factors linked to annexation, uh, prolonged duration, and egregiously abusive conduct. Aggression is illegal in terms of both the responsibility of the state of Israel, and also in terms of individual criminal responsibility. The crime of aggression in the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court is limited to aggression which, because of its, and to quote, its character, gravity, and scale constitutes a manifest violation of the Charter of the United Nations. So for the same reasons that the breach of international law here falls within the occasionally used definition of aggression that covers a subset of the breaches of the law on the use of force, the illegal nature of the use of force meets this ICC definition of the individual crime of aggression. Thus, in terms of the definition, the crime of aggression is being committed by certain individual Israelis. The question left to be determined and beyond the scope of, of my work is who these particular individuals are in terms of meeting the relevant leadership test that is part of that definition of the crime of aggression. To finish, and in parenthesis, what is left, of course, is a right to use force in self-defense in response to actual or imminent attacks on Israel. And here I mean Israel within its borders, not Israel in the form of settlers and settlements or its presence in territory that it claims to have annexed but has not, such as East Jerusalem. Attacks on that Israel from the West Bank or Gaza, for example, rocket attacks from Gaza. Whether the responses that have happened here meet the necessary test for legality is beyond the scope of the work that I have been conducting since that has been on the general existential legitimacy of the everyday overall control exercised over both places as distinct from these particular episodes of defensive response. But, there is a link between the two in the sense that the absence of a broader ongoing right to use force in self-defense over the same area, so over Gaza, for example, means that these episodes, for example, responses to rocket attacks, their legality cannot be folded into a general entitlement to use force when their lawfulness in ad bellum terms is being determined. They must stand or fall legally as individual incidents. So this is significant legally for how the legal test operates, for example, in terms of what constitutes an armed attack and questions of uh, questions of imminence, etc. Um, so although, as I mentioned, in the context of Gaza, the occurrence of these individual incidents is not the only moment where Israel is using force, the point is that there's no valid legal basis for the broader ongoing use of force. And so it, when it comes to assessing the legality of the responses to them by Israel, these incidents have to be addressed in isolation. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, well. I, I, I'll start with two very brief clarification mm. questions if I can. So first, um, and these are very, I think, uh, softball questions, but uh, maybe it's good as a start. Um, do you, 
<clears throat> if you can please clarify whether uh, your position um, changes at all with regard to the West Bank and Gaza, and uh, it, or is it basically the same analysis that applies in, in, in both cases? Um, <clears throat> that's great. that's one question, um, and I think it I think it is the, the basically the same analysis, but I, I just want to make sure I understand. Um, <laughs> With regard to uh, the point made of a lack of um, a right to uh, exercise defense against Israeli citizens beyond the Green Line settlers, <laughs> um, what can, if you can explain what that means, is, is any uh, use of force, uh, whether by the military or by other uh, police forces to defend the lives of those people, is, it doesn't mean that that is a, illegal according to your position? And, and if not, what are the parameters of uh, such a defense, uh, such security uh, operations? And also, can I add to that, uh, yeah. also on this relationship between West, the West Bank and Gaza, it sounded like you're saying, hi, it sounded like you're saying that uh, it is possible that Israeli's responses to rocket attacks from Gaza would be considered uh, legitimate and uh, legal in, 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 in terms of the use of force requirement. Um, uh, so so in, what, what, in what sense Israel's uh, relation with Gaza at the moment or in what sense of control do you mean in relation to Gaza? I can understand this in relation to the West Bank very clearly, but less in, the, in relation to Gaza. Um, so is it like, is it, do you see the, the control connected? Do you see the control over Gaza and the West Bank at the same time? Or let's, you know, if there's a, a different kind of solution to, this, to the problem in Gaza, in, in the West Bank, that Gaza remains the same, it re remains, you know, a separate entity. I think I have a question, if I may. Um, the analysis is, uh, is more, more like a clarification because you say that the uh, self-determination on the, on the exterior sense, uh, I didn't really get it, but uh, on the exterior, is, is automated or is inherent so but it doesn't like really um appear in 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 the world or in reality because let's say just azawad in mali azawad is declared independence 2015 the french came helped the mali and the military to suppress it and there is no self-determination no automated self-determination same with scotland for instance with the idea of self-determination of Scottish people, but it wasn't realized because of, I don't know, because the, the vote didn't came above 50%. So how did, how did, how does it relate to the automated aspect of uh, self-determination? Great question. So um, is, it, is it the same analysis, West Bank and Gaza, and which maybe links also to Karen's question also um, about the nature of control. So essentially, yes, right? But the the, the work, of course, then ex elaborates on, on why it's a yes, right? The use of force in international law, there's no one size fits all uh, definition, just as with occupation as well, there is an overall notion of effective control, but within that, a, a variety of different arrangements can meet the test. And therefore, of course, the issue is not just, you know, comparing Gaza and the West Bank, but looking at different areas of the West Bank, right? And whether the, you know, the occupation uh, is understood to operate across the West Bank in its entirety, uh, or whether somehow a subset of it, uh, perhaps not including Area A. The answer is no. The legal test is sufficiently broad to encompass the nature of the overall exercise of control by Israel in both places. Um, and 
even though it then is instantiated in very different ways. Uh, so, for example, in Gaza, the issue is the obviously the siege uh, being ex together with Israel having an exclusively determinative role in determining the entry and exit of any and all people and food and material items and you know including medical supplies the exclusive control over airspace and maritime territory the control of the water and electricity supply and the ability to reintroduce boots on the ground from its own territory without any impediment so in in you know both sort of West Bank post Oslo and Gaza post Vajoral sort of essentially legal terms amount to a reconfiguration of the nature of Israel's control exercise of control in those two places, which ultimately does not alter the fact that it constitutes um, a, a use of force that then still then falls to be legally determined according to that international law uh, framework. Uh, the question about the um, settlers. Um, so the, the, the consequence of this analysis is that, which is sometimes hard to appreciate because the dominant normative paradigm through which the occupation is, is commonly addressed is in relation to its ostensibly humane conduct, right? So the question is applying IHL and maybe and most of human rights law and saying, you know, in individual in incidents, is Israel behaving in a way that uh, complies with the relevant IHL? Usually it's only IHL standards, even though everyone supposedly uh, adopts a, a you know, integrated approach with human rights law. But in any event, standards that supposedly regulate the conduct of the occupation, not its existence. What that analysis misses is that the very exercise of authority itself is unlawful. So in one, in that fundamental sense, it really doesn't matter if Israel complies with IHL. Uh, it, even if it did, it would still have no right to exercise authority there. And that therefore has consequences equally for uh, the position of uh, settlers, Israel's uh, um, uh, actions to protect them, because Israel has no um, uh, valid legal basis even to be even to be on that land in the first place. It would it, the situation is like in any other situation where a state is concerned about the welfare of its nationals in another state, right? And those nationals may be in trouble, they may be in danger, uh, they may need, need protection. There is no international law basis for that state to lawfully use military action in the other state to protect its nationals. It doesn't have that option. The international law on the use of force for example, by assimilating the state's nationals into the state so that somehow an attack on the national is an attack on the state. That has no legal basis in international law. The protection of the settlers could be enabled by implementing the legal obligation, which is to end their unlawful presence in the first place. So Israel has an option Israel is not faced, unlike in other situations where sometimes there is no means to protect a state's nationals overseas, there, is a, there are means. So international law provides those means. And indeed, the means that international law provides to Israel happen <laughs> to correspond to what actually international law requires of Israel, which is to end the, settler, uh, the settlements and the presence of the settlers in the Palestinian territories. Um, Self-determination. Um, so obviously one of the issues with self-determination is that it's sort of a term like sovereignty or, you know, like love, which means all things to all people. 
and uh, uh, lots of very different and mutually incompatible definitions can be used. Um, and uh, so the question we always have to face is, you know, what do we mean when we use it and, uh, you know, on what basis? So I'm using it in the international law sense of an, uh, of an external right to self-determination, the right of a group of people to determine their external status which is to say to decide whether they remain within or separate from the authority of the, 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 their uh, under. Now, although many groups in the world, sorry about the background noise here, um, I don't have any control over it. Um, many groups in the world um, aspire to that uh, and claim it. Very few are given it in international law. Uh, and the Palestinian people are in that special class because of their uh, being a people of a territory that was subject to colonial rule under the Ottomans and then the, the British in the first half of the 20th century. So it's it, the mandates were a form for the purposes of this international law of self-determination. Mandated territories were a, a type of, I mean, not only in, the, in that legal sense, they were colonies, right? But they, the fact that they were called mandates is, is irrelevant to the application of the international law of external self-determination that emerged in the middle of the 20th century and became applicable to colonial uh, territories generally you know, whether it's, they, they are designated as mandates or then of course under the UN, the trusteeship system or other forms of colonies, which therefore were described, characterized again, euphemistically as non-self-governing territories. So the, so unlike the Scots, uh, uh, the Palestinian people have this external right of external self-determination and um, other situations, including the Scots, other referenda, um, might be, uh, uh, discussions might happen at the discretion of the state uh, within which that group, group is located. The difference here is that it's, it's not about the, uh, the discretion of the, um, the authority within which the people are located. It's a right. So the, so the Scottish people do not have a right of external self-determination. They, they've been given it in the form of that vote that gave them the option to decide whether to go for it or not. But they did not have a right to be given that. Um, the Palestinian people do in international law. I'm not sure... Does that answer your question or were you really asking... Because it's a bit, a bit incoherent because... Right. When you when when you look on on different national movements, and when we look on the, on the mandate system specifically, which you said the the, the British <laughs> mandate, the, the raison d'etre of, of the British mandate was to establish a, a national home for the Jewish people. It's in the it's in the it's in the the constitution of the mandate. So the 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 yeah. international recognition of self determination for a specific. A, a person, a specific people or group is not really coherent in this sense because you say that Palestinians do have that right, but Scots don't have that right because they're not in the same in the same situation. But looking empirically, they're both people with national identities and a desire oh, for yeah. for independence so this, or self determination. Is, absolutely, this is not. Uh, I'm not suggesting that this is fair and just and that the, the groups who get it um, uh, deserve it more than the groups who don't in terms of what international law, the international legal position uh, adopts. I'm not saying that. I'm simply explaining what the legal position is in international law. On the, on the question of the Palestine mandate, um, uh, since you raise it, um, I have a new article uh, it's about to drop in the Journal of the History of International Law, which is about the Palestine Mandate. 
and the question of the incorporation of Balfour into that mandate agreement that you mentioned, mm -hmm. which was uh, a sort of a, a, a agreed last, uh, not last year, a, a, <laughs> a century ago last year, and but but then a century ago, sorry, a century ago this year, 1922, next year is the centenary of when it entered into force and became a legally binding instrument. So in, in many ways, to next year is the centenary of the legal instrument that paved the way for the creation of Israel. Um, and that article discusses the problem, the legal problem of the League of Nations Council departing from the provisions of the League of Nations Covenant in purporting to incorporate the Balfour undertaking of uh, obviously issued before the, these arrangements were adopted into a binding legal instrument. And my argument is that the council did not have the legal competence under the Treaty of Versailles, under the, uh, under the um, uh, covenant of the League of Nations, to bypass Article 22 of the Covenant mm. and acted ultra virus in terms of the international law of uh, uh, the, the law of international organizations in purporting to do that, which has consequences then for the legal cover that that instrument as I say, uh, adopted, entering it, that entered into force in 1923, gave to the UK when it came to what it did in the in its administration of uh, the mandate. But what's... Oh, sorry, just, just to finish the point about self-determination, this, that, that was, a, a of course, before self-determination became accepted as a general proposition applicable to all colonial territories, right? That came later. Mm -hmm. But what's significant is that there was this earlier, essentially a form of external self-determination, although that word is not used, in the mandate in Article 22, the covenant applicable to so-called A-class mandates, of which Palestine was one. Ralph, I think we, the terms of my own mandate here, were to hold you uh, with us until 3.45 local time, which is... Uh, oh, yes. Can I ask a, a very quick question? No, uh, Ralph will decide because he, he has the time constraints. And, do, uh, do you have like a, no, two more minutes? I, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Fine, fine by me. So, so I wanted to ask another question about the temporality that you describe here in terms of like how every day it is this, you know, use of authority and this illegality of the use of authority, oh, uh, the exercise of authority and, uh, and the legality of it. How does it happen? But I'm not going to ask, it's a, it's a larger question. The, 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 the shorter question is, what is the institutional context in which you're making this argument to? Um, and what's the chances of the argument to be heard and to be you know, yeah, used yeah. In, in institutional context? One thing that I <laughs> need Okay, most immediately there is this general assembly vote that's about to happen, which may which may request an advisory opinion of the ICJ to ask this question, right? So it seems to me that I've well, I've been working on this and I've been writing about it. So now I should provide this analysis because it's going to have to be determined by by the ICJ as a sort of follow up to the wall advisory opinion, uh, but also because it the it. it other, other mechanisms of scrutiny and accountability in relation to um, the situation in the West Bank and Gaza are fixated on an exclusive focus on the conduct of the occupation, and they don't want to go anywhere near and will not address whether the occupation should end. So there is this, there is this um, acute dissonance between the position that 
is articulated by the Palestinian people, a desire, uh, 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 an assertion of their right to freedom and end to occupation, and the exclusive focus when it comes to the mechanisms of international law and accountability, which is to in, entirely ignore that and to focus simply on how the occupation is conducted. And all the attention and all of the energy and resources goes into that latter question exclusively. And um, what's striking to me is that this includes, so you would expect this from, say, the ICRC or the Red Crescent or the, you know, the, 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 the organization in Israel, um, uh, because that's their, their, their mandate's limited in that way. But other bodies do not have such a limitation, human rights bodies, for example, because they're implementing human rights law and self-determination is part of human rights law in common article one of the two covenants. So one thing that's that struck me in doing this work is mm -hmm. going through the, um, uh, the, the country reporting system under the two covenants when Israel is before the human rights, the committee that implements both of those two human rights covenants. And, and in both cases, the committee of course addresses the full spectrum of issues between the river and the sea as, a, as they relate to Israel's obligations in human rights law, applying the human rights obligations territorially and extraterritorially. But what's striking is they don't address this issue of whether the occupation should end, on, and if so, on what basis, even though that is the requirement of the law of self-determination. And indeed, they, in a kind of torturous way, have, of course, have to think about address self-determination, uh, but only address it, as it were, uh, within Israel, when it comes to Palestinian uh, Arab citizens of Israel. So some of their scrutiny of Israel has been about the way of the, the position of Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel in self-determination terms, right? So considering and criticizing their position, their treatment by Israel, partly as a denial of their right of self-determination as Israeli citizens. And of course, that is an incredible, um, uh, to, to only address self-determination in that limited way is a, a peculiar uh, approach when it comes to the situation of Palestinians, because essentially what the two committees are saying is we are only going to address your right to self-determination when it comes to essentially the self-determination right of the people of Israel. Right. So it's kind of gaslighting. You know, these bodies are essentially saying we are you come to us for scrutiny about the way you're treated and what we're going to we're going to do use the language of self-determination and we're only going to apply it and understand it and frame it in those terms. And it seems to me that is happening because of this inability and unwillingness to address the implications in self-determination terms of the occupation. So they can only think about self-determination as, as the self-determination of the Israeli people, and therefore of Palestinians only insofar as they are Israeli citizens. Okay, thanks Ralph so much. Um, it was a really um, very, very interesting talk. And, um, we look forward to hopefully being in touch with regard to a possible collection of essays. Um, you will be free to join us or not. I mean, uh, but but we do uh, hope to, hope to proceed with this project in the more uh, Gaza specific uh, vein. I'm saying this to myself as well because I also had a talk that was not uh, so clearly focused on yeah. Gaza. Um, thanks so much, um, and we'll be in touch. Thank you so Thank much. You. All right, bye-bye, take care.